I'm a rogue demon hunter now. Wow. What's a rogue demon? I am so fired up right now. Half glass gaming in. And by that he means he is on fire. Yes. I'm pulling a Richard Pryor. I was freebasing cocaine and decided to end it all. Do you have any more? No. But look, that's not why we're here, okay? Why we are here is to watch WrestleMania 14. No, I'm just joking. It's half glass gaming. Welcome back. Love. It's palpable. I'm Julian. That's Mandy. Hey. That's Josh. Just Josh. That's Josh. Just Josh, too. That's Reverend. I'm trying to remember who the main event was at WrestleMania 14. Ah, uh, was that uh, Austin and Hart? Might have been Austin and Hart. Or was that 11? Look, we're, we're already starting off on the wrong foot. So I'm going to hot foot it over to the right foot and say, I noticed whilst driving over, Josh, you had a little bit of a funk going on. And um, I'm not talking about a body odor, folks, okay? <laughs> I've been paying extra close attention to bumper stickers lately. Mm -hmm. There's very few bumper stickers I've ever seen in my life that don't annoy me somehow. <laughs> but I've been seeing some pretty bizarre ones that, yeah. that have really, you know, stuck in my craw a little bit. Whoa. We, we saw one that said, bark more, wag less. And yeah. I was like, wag more, bark less. It said, yeah, wag more, bark less. And I was trying to figure out what that means because if it were just an ad for like an obedience school for dogs mm -hmm. like they forgot to put the name of the company on yeah. it <laughs> uh, but if it's like you know saying like oh you should complain less and you know be happy more which i think is kind of is the point i guess yeah it's like don't complain so much just be happy swag your tail like i don't agree with it <laughs> Whoa. I disagree. Hold I on. mean, you're barking here. If shit ain't right, you got to fix it, man. You, you don't just wag your tail. Yeah. I, I feel like, as someone who grew up in punk bands and has kind of a anti authoritarian bent, I don't see it not speaking up about shit that ain't right. <laughs> Uh, I don't see it as a viable option for yeah. me. Josh made me research this bumper sticker <laughs> for the record. <laughs> like, we, we get inside, he's like, my, me, my, me not what that, that bumper sticker means. She, she's very much not anti authority. <laughs> I, I, I listen to Josh because I like him. Yeah. But no, oh, this bumper sticker comes from like an ancient Babylonian proverb. It's from the story of Ahikar, okay. which was published around 700 BC. Wow. And it's, my son, sweeten thy tongue and make savory the opening of thy mouth, for the tail of a dog gives him bread and his mouth gets him blows. And that is the source. The bumper sticker. Yeah, so like, yeah. Just, just wake your tail and shut up or someone's going to like punch you or hit you or something. Yeah. Like, I don't agree with that as a life philosophy. I just, I can't. I can't yeah. get behind it. But my favorite thing when I was trying to figure out what it meant is I found some forum post where the guy's like, what does this bumper sticker mean? My girlfriend wants to put it on her car and I want to make sure she doesn't accidentally put a liberal bumper sticker on her car. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like so concerned that his girlfriend would be be tricked into putting a liberal bumper sticker and i'm like i, I think it's just a cute dog bumper sticker man and yeah. everybody's like it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it was just funny because this guy was so concerned and nobody could understand his concern at all oh, yeah. and he was just getting more and more concerned the more people dismissed his concerns yeah it's a good good internet conversation yeah <laughs> And then we got kind of down a rabbit hole because I saw another bumper sticker that said, my other car is a Pynchon novel. I've never read Pynchon. I know a little bit about him. Mm -hmm. uh, Are we talking about Bronson Pinchot? The, uh, Thomas Pynchon. Okay. I thought we were talking about the hilarious 80s actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was, the, what was the show called? Perfect Strangers. Yes, Perfect Strangers. Yes. Standing no. tall. <laughs> On the wings of my dreams. <laughs> he was on some reality show, like, yeah. in the early 2000s. Yeah. Trying to revive his career, and it didn't, didn't happen for him. Yeah, he was doing blow and getting a blow job while driving a Porsche in some 80s movie. Maybe Beverly Hills Cop. Winning. Yeah. But so this bumper sticker, this sounds pretty goddamn pretentious. That shit sounds liberal. 
<laughs> no, I, I looked it up and I found that it was just a bumper sticker some girl made and was selling online. And she said the whole thing was that it's not supposed to make sense. And mm-hmm. you put it on your car and then people will be like, what does it mean? And you're supposed to look at them and be like, what do you think it means? <laughs> and so it just drives other oh. people crazy. Oh, some girl. Like, And I'm like, what a cool girl. What a cool thing to do. Because I kind of hate bumper stickers. Yeah. So I feel like it is making people obsess over bumper stickers. Mm-hmm. But I've seen like th- the my my other car is a blank and you know, I was curious about where the, the origin of that was mm-hmm. and so we looked into it and it was originally something you would put on like your crappy car and be like oh my other car is a Lexus or mm-hmm. something and so it was like mm-hmm. that that was the the joke but people have just like tacked so many things onto it and have reworded it so many times it like doesn't make sense anymore like yeah. It's called my, a meta. My other car is a boat, or my mm-hmm. other car is a license plate on a fish in the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah. My other like, car is thing I like. Yeah. Right. So my other car is Breaking Bad. <laughs> I mean, that probably exists. Yeah. I would be surprised if it didn't. Mm-hmm. My other car is a 20-sided die. Mm-hmm. I did see a bumper sticker um, that said, Hillary Clinton for prison. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know that guy was so proud of that one. Uh-huh. As he pressed into his car, made sure no creases. Got to uh-huh. make sure everyone can read this one. Yep. And he backed into his parking stall that you have to like walk along so it was clear. He was like, eh? Can you see? He probably like looks at his mirror to try and see if other people are like, oh, got to yeah. make sure people see this one. Oh, yeah. He's probably hiding in like a local trash can, just peeking through like <laughs> That's his whole <laughs> life. Trying <laughs> Try to see, <laughs> see if people react. Oh, I... Look at that guy's face. <laughs> yeah, but I thought, eh, she'd probably still lose. <laughs> but, um, <yeah. laughs> Yes. I like really old political bumper stickers that mm-hmm. are super out of date on people's cars. There's a guy that I see who has a Who is John Galt bumper sticker, and I always <laughs> want to rear end him. <laughs> <laughs> what you should really do is build a pen around that guy's car. And then stand there and tell him that there's a toll to open the gate. Because, you know, you built the gate, so it's your property. So you're just being, a, you know, enlightened self-interest. You see, I was trying to remember, because uh, I did read Atlas Shrugged, and I was, unfortunately, and I was trying to remember it. <laughs> right. And, like, this might not be in the book at all, but I have this memory. There's this, like, blonde anti-Robin Hood character, and I just have this mental image of there being a riot and him crawling on top of this car and, like, double-fisting Tommy guns with, like, <laughs> his chest exposed and, like, firing them both into the air and getting people riled up. Yeah. And, like, I don't know if that's in the book or not, but, like, to me, I will always remember that as being... The best part of the book. <laughs> right. The, the best thing I've read that pertains to Ayn Rand is just a list of descriptions of which women wearing the color yellow in Ayn Rand books. Yeah. And it's like, she was obsessed with describing the color yellow. Yeah. It was, it was, she, she would just, she would spend paragraphs describing the color yellow really badly. Oh boy. And it's not good when you're being made to read Atlas Shrugged in school, which I had to do. Oh boy. But when you are wanting to laugh at Ayn Rand on the internet, it's yeah. good times. I saw a side-by-side comparison of a picture of her and a picture of Steve Bus- Buscemi. <laughs> and it was ridiculously uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Steve Buscemi kind of looks like a cute pug that got turned into a person, though. <laughs> and I don't think Ayn Rand is cute. Fair enough. On the Ghost World commentary, they talk about how a bunch of the guys who worked at the movie realize that their wives had things for Steve Buscemi. Well, and they're like, what? Steve <laughs> Buscemi? Really? And they're like, oh, no. Like, there's something mysteriously attractive about him. Oh, yeah. And then they're like, and they were just sort of fascinated by the fact that, like, three guys guys who were working on the set had wives who were just obsessed with Steve Buscemi and they never knew this oh, until yeah. after they cast him in a movie. I yeah. think there's even a thing on the DVD, like the mysterious appeal of Steve Buscemi or something like a shirt that you can watch. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people just put these bumper stickers on their car and don't think about 
anything. They just think uh, I should probably put stickers on my car. And I don't know mm-hmm. why. I can't really relate to that. Yeah, they definitely don't think about devaluing their vehicle. I just can't imagine having any ideas I want to convey to their... I mean, I don't want to say hello to other people mm-hmm. because I'm too private for that. Mm-hmm. So I feel like sharing my thoughts on a bumper sticker is just too much. But I think people put these things there. Don't necessarily give them a lot of thought unless they're, you know, the Hillary prison guy who <laughs> thinks about it every waking moment. Yeah. And so they put these things on their car and they don't know anything mm-hmm. about their history. It's like how most people who play roguelikes or use the word roguelike don't even know that rogue exists. Yeah. It's a game. Why are they called roguelikes? What a weird name. Yeah. As he sits there with his Che Guevara t-shirt on. And... <laughs> no, speaking of roguelikes, I've been playing this game called Cyrilim. It's amazing. It's so good. It's it's like this old pixel art roguelike. I mean, it's it's new. <laughs> so it's an old-like roguelike. It's an old-like. Um, I mean, it's still roguelike. It's not rogue. It's just a roguelike. It's roguelike. Like a lot of the roguelikes I've played more recently, like Binding of Isaac or things like that, uh, are, you know, modernized takes on, you know, the rogue premise. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of permadeath in that stuff. But in Cyrilim, there's no permadeath. And so all of the progress you make in a dungeon, even after you die, you still get to keep. And so the whole point is building your kingdom and, you know, you go through dungeons and, like, recruit people to come live in your kingdom mm-hmm. or you are grinding for materials to invest in various parts of your kingdom and things like that. Mm-hmm. And you can just keep leveling and keep leveling and keep leveling. I don't know what the level cap is, but I don't think there's a hard cap. I want to say it's maybe 999 just because of, like, they would have to add another character after that. Yeah. But I'm not sure. I know in, like, Disgaea, you can get up to 9999. Uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm not sure how how high Serlem goes, but um, I've put dozens of hours into it, and I'm at like maybe level sixty, mm-hmm. and so I can't imagine ever getting up past like four or five hundred. But it's super good, and I it's you know it's on the PS4 and and Vita now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was on it's been on Steam for a while since 2015. I I always kind of thought that permadeath was the main feature of a roguelike. Well, my friend, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to call for a break because when we come back, we might have an answer to that. Oh, good. Stick around, Reverend. Yeah, I'm not promising that. Okay, so you know, look, I'm going to call for a break. I got to thank Wheelie2XAA for the beats, yo. Holler at your boy. Um, Retrovolve.com. You know, where you'll find several different articles related to things. Um, Of course, you can find us on halfglassgaming.com, where you'll find a detailed list of all of the games that we discuss in every juicy topic. iTunes, we're there as well. Uh, Subscribe. Feel free to rate us as well. Leave comments in any format or venue. Uh, you got a piece of chalk? Leave a comment on the sidewalk. Uh, we're also on Stitcher. Meh, you know. When we come back from the break, though, and we are coming back from the break, yo, uh, we're going to get into a little discussion about roguelikes. So, look, we're going to get into uh, today's discussion um, about roguelikes. You know, I always just thought it was like some dumb phrase that I didn't really understand that it was actually commenting on a game, apparently, that was actually called Rogue, which many believe to have uh, been the originator of Rogue mechanics. Is this true, Mandy? Is this false? Rogue isn't even the verse commercially released roguelike. Mm. But it's still roguelike. It's still, yes, even though it predates Rogue. (laughs) And the thing is, the creation of Rogue is weird because at one point there were multiple people working on it privately at the same time Mm -hmm. developing their own versions of this game. Mm -hmm. So precise dates are hard to come by, but in terms of which one was officially commercially released first. The first one released is Beneath Apple Manor. Okay. Which was commercially released in 1978 and Roguelike wasn't commercially released Rogue. until... <laughs> 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 and Rogue wasn't commercially released until 1980. Okay. So 
Well, should we answer the lingering question? Isn't, isn't permadeath like one of the key features of a roguelike? I mean, this is very debated. There is actually a conference held in 2008 to try and determine the definition of a roguelike. And so that's called the Berlin interpretation. I was going to say, was it, it was, in Helsinki? It was in Berlin. Okay. So they have high value factors, which are a game is more likely to be a roguelike if it contains all these factors. And then they have low value factors, which are common factors associated, but less necessary. Mm -hmm. And so permanent failure is one of the high value factors and not necessarily permadeath, but that you can have some kind of failure with permanent consequences. So like you permanently lose your items Mm -hmm. that you're holding if you die in a dungeon. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of disagreement a lot of people strongly disagree with the Berlin interpretation. And I mean, only people who would fly to Germany for an international roguelike, roguelike development conference had a say in this. Yeah. People who really had a horse in that race. They're like, oh, I've been thinking about this for 20 years. My opportunity has finally arrived. Yeah. Yeah. I need to be on that flight. Yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering how how do you get to a position where you're going, you know what? This question is so bothersome and so widespread. So much rests on the answer of this question <laughs> that I can't just do it alone. No. I can't we can't just have an email list. Yeah. The only way to make this happen is to have a conference with live people in Berlin, Germany. Yeah. Let's oh, set and I that mean, up. you have to, you should read over their conference statement and see, like, how seriously they took it, too. Well, they have to. And how badass are you as the person who, like, started this to say, look, this is it, Jack. This is the definitive collection of thought that we're going to compile to define what a rogue is. And if you aren't here, fuck you, man. Right. Like, how, how do you get to the point where that's a good idea? And mm-hmm. I think more importantly, how do you get to the point where you're hearing someone else tell you it's a good idea and you go, you know what? I'm on board. Yeah. I subscribe to this newsletter. Let's do it. Yeah, let's like, spend thousands of dollars on this. How, how did you get there? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Berlin was very nice that time of year. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe some people were just like, you know, I've been wanting to visit Berlin. Hey, yeah. This is a good excuse for hey, it. <laughs> here there are some excellent brews right now. Yeah. It's a great time to drink seasonal beer. Mm-hmm. Was it in October? It was in October. Oh, well, there you yeah. go. Well, there October's you go. October's okay. Case. That was Probably. Right answered <laughs> <laughs> yeah get some vena sausage and i mean snuff and you're ready to go yeah I'd like write it you... off as a work expense if you develop games for a living be like oh no i, I have to go to berlin it's the international roguelikes development conference yeah, yeah right so now, now we have some answers <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was in Germany and I flew back on October first. I that's, missed that's everything. Sad. Yeah, I would have. I would have accidentally missed my flight. Well, there's another guy because I was there for a um, for a gaming event um, for work, and there was another guy in my group that just like called the the game publisher and was like, "Look, man." I want to stay another night. Can you, you know, just extend my hotel stay? And they're like, sure. And so then he just like went to Berlin for a day and enjoyed Oktoberfest and then flew back the next day. Yeah. (laughs) That guy had all the right moves. He did. Okay. So there are games before Rogue. (laughs) Then Rogue comes out and it creates its own genre where people say any game similar to this coming out after this game is roguelike. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about Rogue in the Minecraft episode of the podcast. But the thing is that Rogue was free and Rogue was distributed with the Linux OS version that Mm -hmm. was on most college computers. So all these guys all across the country who were studying video game programming were Mm -hmm. playing the same game at the same time. And so a lot of people were designing similar types of games at the same time because Rogue is influenced by D&D. They were using similar cursor commands to develop these games. So it's easy to see why all these things were developed concurrently. Mm -hmm. But um, Rogue is just the one that cut on because it's the one most people played first because everybody had access to it who was learning game development in 1980. So it was like it was free. It came with Yeah, it, it, on all the, every, every college computer across the country pretty mm-hmm. much had this version of the Linux OS and they just included it with it. And so all these people all across the country learning game development were playing Rogue mm-hmm. at the same time. And so that's why Rogue is the genre name or just like adventure might not, may not have been the first adventure game mm-hmm. but it's the one that named the genre adventure. Mm-hmm. I suppose. I mean, I guess we're in Germany right now. Let's pretend. All right. What are the core mechanics of a rogue-like or rogue in and of itself? According to the Berlin interpretation? According to Hoyle. 
I don't care. Let me just get the facts because I am struggling to understand what this game even is. Um, random environment generation. Okay. Permanent failure. Okay. Turn based. Uh, grid based. High complexity. Research management. Exploration and discovery. So is it like fantasy RPG. It doesn't settings? have to be fantasy. Be sci-fi? Yeah, there are. <clears throat> sci- I mean, NetHack, for example. Well, okay. Toe Jam and Earl is is a roguelike. Are you kidding me? No. That's a definitive statement. I can take that to the it's, bank and cash. Toe Jam and Earl's based on rogue. Yeah. The, um, so the, is permadeath in that game? Well, you. you I get mean, I guess three, obviously you run out of lives. At yeah, some you point, run out of lives and then it's over. You know, I, I spoke with Greg Johnson, mm-hmm. one of the creators of Toe Jam and Earl, and one of the things he was big on is like, yeah, I just fell in love with rogue, and we like stole everything we knew from rogue and mm-hmm. just you know put goofy aliens in it and instead of in, like in rogue you're you know descending through layers of a dungeon like you're ascending layers of earth mm-hmm. in toe jam and earl so it's like just a reverse on that he he talked about how various enemy types in toe jam and earl were based on enemy types in rogue how they would give you a certain status effect mm-hmm. And he he based those status effects on status effects that certain enemies would give you in Rogue. Mm-hmm. So when we say dungeon crawling, I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, we're we just talking about grinding and loot. A, a game where the primary mechanic of the game is to explore dungeons mm-hmm. and see what you find there. Like Fight Skyrim. monsters, look for loot. Uh, Skyrim is absolutely not a roguelike, and I think that kind of indicates why it's important to acknowledge that roguelikes need to have multiple aspects, mm-hmm. because um, it you the primary goal is exploration, but the dungeons in Skyrim are not procedurally generated in any form or fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, not only is there no permadeath, there's not really any permanent consequences to death unless you forgot to save. Mm-hmm. Uh so, like, the exploration aspect is the only thing it has similar to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if, you know, if you're just looking at one aspect, then, yeah, you'd call it a roguelike. But it's not. So some of the common features, you got dungeon crawling. You got procedurally generated levels. From time to time, you got turn-based combat. But much like I just did now when I associated Skyrim, I mean, is this roguelike term uh, becoming overused is oh, oversaturated. Absolutely. I think the way people tend to use it is just anything with permadeath gets called a roguelike. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen Fire Emblem get called a roguelike. Mm-hmm. I mean, Dark I mean Souls. and that's an easy game to decide. Yeah. yeah, Dark Souls too. I've seen people call Dark Souls a roguelike mm-hmm. or roguelikes a Souls like. And I mean. <laughs> No, because another thing came, th- those came first. And I mean, permadeath doesn't make something a roguelike, especially when something has a really clear genre like Fire Emblem. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of weird usage of the term. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that so many people don't know where the word roguelike comes from. Mm-hmm. And they just think, oh, that must be a word for games with blank feature. Mm-hmm. So any game with dungeon crawling, I will get, I will see people call it a roguelike. Mm-hmm. And any game with permadeath, I see people call it a roguelike. See, and this is interesting because, you know, honestly, for me uh, specifically, the term roguelike is almost like a new thing, almost like it's had a resurgence. Yeah. So I would assume then there was a period when there was possibly a slight decline. Yeah, yeah, roguelikes were really popular in the 80s because they were something that was really easy to develop with limited tools. Mm -hmm. They required very few graphics because they were really just tile-based and you could basically look at how other roguelikes were programmed Mm -hmm. and then come up with your own version of that program. So they were a really great project for a beginner programmer to try and make. And that is who is making most roguelikes were people studying programming in college. Quote unquote, rogues. (laughs) <laughs> rogues <laughs> who played rogue on their college computer when they were supposed to be doing classwork. <laughs> then in the 90s, uh, roguelikes sort of started to fall out of favor here, mm-hmm. though my childhood roguelike did come out in the 90s. Mm. That's Castle of the Winds. Okay. But uh, roguelikes became really popular in Japan at that time. That's when the Mystery Dungeon series started. The Mystery Dungeon series is now popu- pretty popular. Even here, there are Pokemon versions of the Mystery Dungeon games, so they're sort of roguelikes for little kids. Yeah, Pokemon. And they're, they're great. They're really good games. Yeah. Well, there was the, uh, the Chocobos one. Too. Yeah, that's true. There was a mystery- Chocobo Mystery Dungeon. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask, I mean, is this sort of uh, an American phenomenon, or does this sort of branch out? 
into other aspects of the world. So yeah, no, you... um, I would say roguelikes were far more popular in Japan for a long period of time. And then uh, they really started to have a resurgence here. And that was partially because Japanese roguelikes were getting brought over here, particularly because of on the DS, which is a great system for roguelikes because of the second touchscreen. Okay. And it working so well, tile-based maps. So the Etrian Odyssey series, which has you draw your own maps on the touchscreen to keep track of where everything is. Uh-huh was moderately successful here Uh and then indie developers were drawn to roguelikes for similar reasons that programmers were initially drawn to them that they're reasonably easy to program Mm -hmm. and that you can look at how other games like this are programmed and learn from it and then spelunky which was released in 2008 the -hmm. same year as the berlin conference was a game that took a lot of roguelike mechanics and used them in a really different way. So you could kind of contribute um, some of the American resurgence, perhaps, to a game like Spelunky. Yeah. So, I mean, in and of the group, I don't have any, but I mean, do we have roguelikes that were quite fun? Reel it in, buddy. I really like Rogue Legacy, which is a uh, 2D platformer uh, where you go through a castle that's procedurally generated, mm-hmm. find treasure and gold, uh, and every time you die, you keep your gold and you can buy power-ups and whatever uh, that can be used by you know, future characters. Uh, the gimmick is that every new life is one of your heirs. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, bloodlines have issues, uh, there will be random flaws and, and benefits. Like, you know, there'll be giantism and the sprite will be big. Uh, and it like it makes it harder to knock you back, but you're big and have a harder time getting through some crevices. Yeah. Or, you know, the, in there. And, and there's some that just one. I cannot remember the technical term, but it's a fear of chicken. Oh, and Mandy. That's like Mandy's arch nemesis. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so in, in the game, you know, you uh, you get more health by wall turkey. Okay. Uh, but if you have a, a fear of chickens and, like, you hit a candle and a, a wall turkey comes out, it actually runs around the screen like an enemy and you have to hit it again because you're fearful of, of chickens. Yeah. So Is it, it on PC? I uh, I have it on PC. I yeah. got it on Steam. I think that it's on PS4. Yeah, I have yeah. It on PS4. So it's on PS4 too. Word. I mean, my favorite roguelike, I think, is Binding of Isaac. Okay. Yeah, I've talked about it before on the podcast, but mm-hmm. I it's a game that I've I keep going back to, and every time I go back to, it feels fresh and new again, mm-hmm. and I just I don't think I'll ever get sick of that game, mm-hmm. and I'm not very good at it, but. <laughs> I still like it. Mandy? Yeah, I mean, I play a lot of Japanese games, and roguelikes were much more popular in Japan for a long period than they were here. Mm -hmm. So I play the Mystery Dungeon games. I play the Etrian Odyssey games. Mm -hmm. I have, like, Sorcery Saga on my Vita, which is a game where you go through dungeons to try and find better curry ingredients and then make curry with them. Wow, okay. I like curry, so maybe I'll have to play that (laughs) game It's a good game. Yeah, get some recipes. But the game that really got me into roguelikes was uh, Castle of the Wind, which Mm -hmm. was developed by Rick Sata while he worked for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It's a really basic, simple roguelike. You're uh, somebody in a generic fantasy town and somebody sets fire in the town and kills your family. And so you try and go through this dungeon (laughs) to figure out, you know, what happened and avenge your family. It was Tolkien fans. (laughs) And I mean, it took me so long to beat this game. Uh Uh-huh. And then I get to the ending and they're like, you've completed part one of Castle of the Winds. If you want to play part two, send a check to this address. They're like, my parents aren't going to send a check to some (laughs) random dude. (laughs) So I've never played the second half. But I think the thing I liked the most about it is whenever you found a treasure chest, the item inside it could be cursed. And you could cast a spell to find out what it was before you put it on or you could put it on. And I got so excited about that mechanic. Like, I was obsessed with it. And, like, that's the thing, I think, that got me to play that game over and over again until I finally beat the final boss. 
Well, that isn't a that a, good hook. Yeah, I mean, isn't that like one of the elements that makes a roguelike is that that element of like gambling, right? You know, getting getting an item and not knowing if it's good or not. Yeah, 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 and I get super into that. And I mean, I feel like the best roguelikes are really good about that, mm-hmm. where you can have this amazing run and everything goes so perfectly for you. Yeah. And, and so even if you screwed up a, a hundred times, things can be perfect mm-hmm. in one run and then you can clear everything and it feels really good. Yeah. In Serum, there's they have different realms and there's one realm called the Chaos Realm and everything's... Um, chaotic. Yeah, everything's chaotic. And you there, you meet these statues and you, you can revive them and bring them back to life. And you might get a positive bonus or you might get a negative bonus or you might get a neutral bonus. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it'll just summon like a really powerful swarm of monsters. And other times it'll just give you a reward. Mm-hmm. And then there's other times where it's just like tells you a big long story and like... You know, I weeped over the memories of my father and mm-hmm. it like, you know, does stuff like that. Yeah. And there's, there's, there are some statues that'll just be like, I found you worthy of reward. And then you like wait for it and they're like, but I don't have one to give you or something <laughs> like that. Oh, that game is so funny. Yeah. The, you, you pick up all sorts of random things off the ground or collect loot and it sometimes you can find like a piece of paper and it just has like a lewd drawing of some guy's mom. <laughs> and then one of your monsters like it takes it away yeah. for later. Oh. <laughs> oh, there are potions and you can make your monsters drink them and they can have benefits so they can make all your monsters sick or... Yeah, it's like, you do the wise thing and make your monsters test the the potion. (laughs) I know, it's a great game. It's super fun. Yeah. So, the future of roguelikes. What are we thinking? The Witcher 3? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) The Witcher 3. You know? It's reimagined as a roguelike. I mean, I would play it. Yeah. I mean, how like how roguelike would you say something like Diablo is? Because it has a lot of the elements, but it's also it, it's certainly influenced. Are by the dungeons roguelikes. procedurally generated? Oh, In yes. Diablo, yes. Are they? Some of them are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a big element of a lot of the games that are Diablo likes. Oh, God. Is, no. I just made that up now. Join that's us next a, week. We, that's, okay. that's not a real genre. No, that's <laughs> Actually, I think, Diablo I think I've heard a lot of uh, Diablo okay. clone. Yeah, around. Diablo Diablo clone is, Diablo is, is what, what I call it. But. <laughs> a lot of those games have that random element, like mm-hmm. a randomly generated dungeon element to it. Uh, I mean, that's that's a big part of Diablo 3's post game is, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, just grinding randomly generated dungeons. Well, there, there are sections that are not randomly generated, and I feel like we get lost more in the sections that are not randomly generated than the ones that are. In the beginning, Diablo 3 was not the game that it is now, but... Mm-hmm. You know, they've they've focused so hard on, you know, patching and, and you know, reimagining the game. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there's a ton of randomly generated mm-hmm. stuff to do. The spot we always get lost in is when we look for stuff in that big open field in Act 2. And that is not for shoes regenerated and we get lost every time. Mm-hmm. So there are specific characteristics, I guess you could say, of the roguelike, as we've already determined. You know, we didn't need to go to Germany to do it, but maybe we need to book a field trip. I don't know. So looking forward to, like, the future of the genre, I mean, is there any r- wriggle room, you know, to sort of... Wriggle room? Wriggle room? Is there any wiggle room to um, spice things up a bit? Is there room to grow and expand, or are we just going to kind of keep seeing sort of like the same thing over and over with maybe a few clever touches here and there, do you think? Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, Darkest Dungeons, okay, uh, which is a 2D dungeon explorer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dungeons are procedurally generated, uh, and there there is permadeath. But the expansion is that there's also, like, a kind of risk reward in not only training but keeping various party members healthy because mm-hmm. so as as the adventures are exploring they can pick up diseases or they pick up stress mm-hmm. and yeah, get you know mental quirks and derangements mm-hmm. uh and some of these are beneficial but just as many of them are detrimental mm-hmm. uh and so when you get out of the dungeon and back into town, you have the opportunity to, you know, let them go for a night on the town and, and relieve some stress or whatever. And that costs money in addition to training them and getting them equipped. Uh, so you can do that or you can just go, yeah, I'm just going to release them and get rid of them. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and just hire new explorers that are at level zero. Doras, maybe. Right, Doras. Uh, <laughs> they, they've got a map, and that's all. <laughs> that might be where roguelikes go. Like, okay, so here's, here's what we got. We need mm-hmm. to have permanent failure state somehow we need a uh, procedurally generated yada yada mm-hmm. so what what can we branch off of that as a mechanic mm-hmm. more character exploration you're right okay no i think the big thing i'm seeing now is what people are calling rogue lights mm-hmm. where people just take certain elements of roguelikes and use them and then ignore other major elements and don't worry about adhering closely to any definition Mm -hmm. of roguelikes. So just finding inspiration. (laughs) So just sampling. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say even that Don't Starve is a roguelite in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. combined with survival mechanics in that it's got permadeath Mm -hmm. and it's got procedurally generated worlds, but the gameplay is built around survival mechanics. Right. It's been called a roguelike by certain people mm-hmm. on, on the internet. Yeah, so. mm-hmm. but I, I would call it a roguelite survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't. Th- like, that wouldn't be my, my first pick for a descriptor. Yeah. I mean, it's it's influenced by rogue, but not super heavily. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the big thing, because roguelike mechanics can work with all kinds of genres. Mm-hmm. And worry, right. worrying too much about living up to the Berlin interpretation of roguelikes is not necessarily the secret to developing yeah. a great game. And even the people who attended the Berlin conference for very pure, Mm -hmm. not beer-related reasons... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> have said that they don't want those rules to constrain video game developers. Yeah. So. Yeah. so they were there for the beer. Oh, I mean, absolutely. They, yeah. They, at the end of the conference, they're like, but we don't. It's not a hard and fast. Let's go drink. Yeah. So, I mean, I think going forward, you know, much like we've seen with obviously, and I've touched on this before, RPG elements kind of being married into other genres, the dating sim elements, you kind of start to find like these roguelike samplings finding their way into other genres. And perhaps, I mean, that's the future of gaming, right? This sort of amalgamation of everything. Procedurally you know? generated girls in dating sims. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> I'd play it. Procedurally generated girls in dating sims. From the mouth of babe. <laughs> <laughs> Half glass gaming out. Look, we could sit here all day discussing wrestling, but that's what we do on our wrestling-centric podcast, Half Steel Cage Wrestling. You guys all need to demand that we do that, Half, <laughs> so that I can make these people sit here and listen when I have something useful yeah. to say. We can call it Podcastlemania. <laughs> Not to be confused with my Castlevania-centric podcast, <laughs> Podcastlevania, which is just a remake of every other podcast. 